Last week in Michigan politics, after multiple tornadoes ravaged communities across southwest Michigan, officials have been updating on just how much damage was done and what they're doing now to see if federal aid could be on the way. Plus, after some of Ottawa County had wrestled with the prospect of a 60% raise for its next Board of Commissioners, we're now learning why state law says that proposal wasn't valid to begin with. And a man found not guilty of supporting a plot to kidnap Governor Gretchen Whitmer is now running for local office, where he's aiming to become resident's next sheriff. I'm Josh Albertus, and this is your 13 on your side rundown. Nearly a week after multiple tornadoes touched down in southwest Michigan, officials this week shared their preliminary numbers on just how much damage was done. These numbers may help determine how much federal assistance may be needed if the state makes a request to help those affected by the storm. We went to Portage earlier this week, one of the hardest hit cities, to hear what officials had found. Assistance could be on the way for those impacted by last week's storms over southwest Michigan that resulted in multiple tornadoes and futures left uncertain in neighborhoods like this one. You know, there are people that really are suffering and our hearts yeah. go out to them. Greg and Carol Nelson were on their way out to get another chainsaw when we caught them. The couple who've lived in Michigan for over 20 years and also lived in Nebraska for nearly two decades said when they came back up from the basement, They'd never seen anything like it. And the first things that, that he said was, this is really bad, <laughs> because yes. he looked out the window. So it was just like nothing we've ever seen. While much of their neighborhood suffered heavy damage, this house that they live in thankfully didn't suffer nearly as much. Still, they say they've been involved in helping the neighborhood sift through the debris. Nerves are a little bit frayed, <laughs> I think in general. So. Um, but for us, uh, we didn't have that much cleanup we needed to do. We're helping out some neighbors, too, on an um, as-needed basis. For people in their neighborhood and elsewhere in need, the governor last week declaring a state of emergency to move resources more quickly. But what's remained an open question is whether federal assistance is on its way to bring people much needed relief. We can put in a request once there's been an assessment, and we can put some figures to the, to the request. And so that's why the work of all the people that are here that are trying to take an account of all the different damage that's happened is so important right now. So, but until we have that, I can't submit anything to the federal government. And that's why we're trying to, going to try to move fast here. The local authorities have moved to make quick progress on that. On Monday, Kalamazoo County Emergency Management sharing the preliminary numbers of their surveys to submit to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, and potentially get those impacted more of the assistance they may need. We had a total of 60 destroyed structures. We had 129 major damage. Then we had over 400, and this still to be determined, as far as um, minor damage or just affected structures. On top of that, FEMA is set to visit the area themselves this week to make joint assessments at the state's request and help the state decide whether to seek federal aid. So we're looking at whether or not people have insurance. We're looking at the extent of damage. We're looking at the uh, the impact to the communities. We're looking at what the needs are. We're looking at uh, how many homes were damaged. We're looking at impact to infrastructure. We're looking at personal property losses. The Nelsons believe there may be need for guidance and financial assistance to help deal with wreckage on private property. But until that may come, their neighborhood leans on each other. And as FEMA began assessing on Wednesday this week, 13 on your side's Julie Koharik was imported to update us on the latest. Yeah, this could be the first major step towards help for a lot of families and businesses that need it. And it's places like Oak Brook Estates that really do need it. This house completely demolished, but it's also the first step in a long process. Three teams in Kalamazoo County will review the extent and severity of the storms to determine potential aid people could receive and if this warrants an official disaster declaration. We spoke with a representative from FEMA about how this process works. So this is the first step in the process towards um, a federal disaster declaration. Right now we're gathering that information. That information is going to go to the state of Michigan, who's going to make a decision about whether or not the, the level of damage exceeds their ability to recover without federal assistance. If they 
believe that it's beyond their ability, then they will make a request to FEMA and FEMA will make a decision. We're committed to making those decisions and moving through this process as quickly as possible. We also spoke with a resident of the neighborhood. Her house was okay, but she says this is a retirement community, so that money is extra important. One thing that I think is kind of scary is that so many of these houses, like ours, have been here a long time. When we bought them, they were relatively inexpensive. Now, to replace a house, maybe it's three, four times the cost. And this is a retirement community. Uh, we're fine, but we're not working anymore. And so we have our whatever to live on. <laughs> some people can afford it and some people won't be able to. They also have crews today in Branch, Cass, and St. Joseph counties. And if you haven't spoken to a representative yet, but you have damage, MSP says the best way to do that is on their self-reporting tool on their website. In Portage, Julie Coherick, 13 on your side. A man found not guilty of supporting a plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer is running for a local sheriff's office. The Detroit News reported last week that Eric Molitor filed papers to run in the Wexford County Sheriff Republican primary in August. Molitor and two others were found not guilty of providing support for a terrorist act. He is facing current Sheriff Trent Taylor, who is running for a third term in the primary. Molitor told the Detroit News that he is running on the pledge to not enforce the so-called red flag laws that can take guns away from people who are alleged to be a danger to themselves or to others. Outside local politics, but on our network, ABC News announcing on Wednesday that former President Donald Trump and current President Joe Biden have agreed to a head-to-head -head debate. This debate will happen on September 10th. Ahead of that, according to ABC News, the two presumptive major party nominees will also debate on CNN late next month. If such a debate were to happen in June, it'd be much earlier than the traditional schedule structured each cycle by the Commission on Presidential Debates, which usually coordinates debates later in the year towards September and October. The debate will air on ABC News, ABC News Live, and Hulu. The Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy here in Michigan announced $20 million in environmental justice grants for people in the state. The department is accepting applications from community organizations for equity focused projects. The focus of the projects are to improve local public health, monitor pollution, clean up contamination, remove blight and enhance indoor air quality in schools and child care facilities. And Governor Whitmer championed the grant saying, quote, today's environmental justice impact grants will be invested into communities facing disproportionate environmental and public health challenges. Each applicant can apply through July 15th for up to $500,000 in funding for their project. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is working with Michigan's Department of Agriculture and Rural Development to strengthen the state's food supply chain. An $8 million investment will support projects designed to build resiliency across the middle of the state's supply chain. The funding aims in part to expand capacity for processing and distribution of agricultural products, benefit new and underserved farmers and ranchers, enhance focus on small and medium-sized enterprises, and modernize equipment and processes. MDARD is accepting applications for grant funding on their website through June 17. Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel is pushing back against DTE's request to increase their rates on natural gas. DTE Gas Company requested a $266 million rate increase for customers in January of 2024, and now Nestle is saying that is too much. Nestle argues that the utility should get no more than a $112.2 million increase, which would equate to about a 4% increase in customers' bills. Nestle claims that part of the rate hike would include customers paying for DTE's corporate jet travel by executives. DTE addressed this claim in a statement to 13 on your side, saying in part, quote, regarding travel expenses, a fraction of the cost for limited air travel for business appropriate needs, including industry association meetings, which provide best practices and information sharing to run best in class energy companies, 
as well as meetings necessary to attract capital investment into Michigan were included in the initial DTE gas rate request. DTE is also seeking to increase rates for their electric customers as well. The next hearing on the proposed gas rate hike is set for June 18th. In Grand Rapids, we've heard from leaders in the city's tourism industry as the city has approved a grant to restore parts of the Grand River. The grant totals $7 million related to the Grand River Revitalization Project, which had its framework altered last year. The city says the money can be put toward multiple river related projects. This was passed by the city commission on Tuesday of last week as they also moved forward on a reimbursement request for $145,000 for costs from last August's tornado. The funds were told can be used for muscle relocation, removal of dams and project construction. As some tourism industry leaders held an event last week celebrating the city's industry, its accomplishments and its hopes. We spoke to some about the restoration effort and how it may relate to making Grand Rapids a place to be. They believe having the river running right through downtown make, makes efforts to activate the river's potential necessary. We did a destination asset study way back in 2016 and a lot of things came out of that study, including the amphitheater and, and soccer as a potential professional sport. But the number one mentioned by the consultants was get your river done. My understanding, it's been scaled back from its orig original version. I think we all wanted the original version. But at this point, we just need to activate our river and our riverfront uh, more so than it already is. And so I'm confident that those in charge will make certain that we get an active river. It's exciting not just for residents, but also visitors alike. A city committee also approved funding no more than $1.5 million from this grant to be put toward muscle relocation. In Ottawa County, a proposed 60% pay increase for the Ottawa County Commission starting next year will not be put up for a vote. Tuesday, we learned it was pulled from the agenda at the last minute because the chairman said it is invalid. We were at that meeting to bring you the details on what happened. A sudden change in Ottawa County, where the county's Board of Commissioners had been expected Tuesday morning to consider a proposal on whether to increase pay for commissioners by 60% in 2025. While the item had been on the agenda until Tuesday morning, it was then removed before it could be considered. The board chair said that's because the resolution could not be considered to begin with. I removed the officer's compensation resolution from the agenda today because it was invalid. With three of their seven members absent, the county's officers' compensation commission had voted at a previous meeting three to one to approve the increase. Board Chair Joe Moss, however, pointed to a Michigan law that stipulates that support from a majority of all of those appointed and serving on the compensation commission is required for it to take action. The part about the 60% raise for the board of commissioners is invalid. It was not voted on by a majority of the compensation commission uh, in a, to approve it. And so because of that and because of Michigan law, the Board of Commissioners in Ottawa County will receive no raises in 2025 or 2026. Some commissioners raised concerns as to why the item had been on the agenda if it was invalid. Who then gives the final approval that then gets made public, that it then goes out? Who has the last say? Where does the buck stop with the agenda? The administrator's office. It stops at your desk? Yes. Okay. So you hold the responsibility to make sure that what we see is legal and is following Michigan statutes. That's typically how it works. But Moss asserting fault in the overall situation lied with the Compensation Commission's chair and reports of what he called a phantom 60% proposal. The next day, the chair of the Compensation Commission responding to the reference to the law we were not aware of in our initial reporting saying in part that he acknowledges Moss's input on that law that was brought up at the meeting. And that's the rundown for your week in Michigan politics. Be sure to keep up with all the top political stories of the day, both on air and online at 13onyourside.com. We'll see you next week.